It is virtually impossible today for the practicing physician to not be exposed to the technology of radiology. From CT scanning, MRI scanning, ultrasonography and fluoroscopy, among other techniques, the physician will be required to use a plethora of tools to image their patients and study normal and abnormal anatomy, otherwise known as pathology. Welcome to this presentation on an introduction to radiographic anatomical techniques. In this short insight lecture, you'll be exposed to a multitude of technologies used in imaging the human body, allowing us to solve more complex disease puzzles than ever before. I hope you enjoy the presentation. Oh, and on one other note, get used to looking under the paperclip icon of these Adobe Presenter presentations. It's there that you'll find the PowerPoint, document files, and other PDF files that contain important information. The PowerPoint for this presentation can be found there too. Download it from there and follow along if you'd like. And if you're using a Mac, make sure that you have the most recent version of Adobe Reader on your computers. You'll need it to play these presentations. Chapter 1 of the required textbook, Sectional Anatomy for Imaging Professionals, is where you should start reading for this presentation. No, we won't be interpreting cross-sections of a human anatomy just yet. We need to get familiar with the language of radiology and the orientation of the human body first. When I say required reading, I mean it. You must read your textbooks and use the PowerPoints as the adjunct to your learning, not the other way around. A PowerPoint is the teacher's tool. The textbook is your tool. Combining the two will make you a better student and a smarter doctor. Start medical school off right and don't just use the PowerPoints. That's a huge mistake. While it's important to get into the habit of reviewing the lecture objectives from each presentation, don't get addicted to them. Learning objectives, as we use them in the anatomy department, will help you focus your knowledge on those structures which we expect you to know. But they are no means inclusive. They are by no means the end all of your anatomy education. In this presentation, you should learn to recognize some common forms of radiographs used in the diagnosis and management of human disease. You should begin to assimilate cross-sectional anatomy as a tool in understanding human form and function. You should also begin to ascertain what type of radiographic modality is used to create a particular image on your patient. And equally important is learning the history of radiology. We do this by teaching you some of the basic physics involved and in turn asking you to memorize some of the important names in radiology, such as Tesla, Hounsfield, and Rentgen. For example, in your examination of a patient who will require an MRI, the strength of an MRI is measured in Teslas. The magnet strength and the ability to increase that strength will improve resolution and determine whether, for example, your patient can have a breast MRI performed. Hounsfield units, named after the inventor of the CT scanner, help the radiologist determine whether a structure is solid, blood, pus, fluid, etc. These names are not superfluous to your education. Know them and learn them now. Here's a basic summary of radiographic techniques you'll be exposed to as a physician. Simple x-rays called plain x-rays, i.e. like a chest x-ray or an abdominal film, to look at a fracture or to look at an underlying anatomy without using a more complicated tomogram serves as the basis for most radiology. We'll learn later what a tomogram is. If you've ever seen an old Bugs Bunny cartoon, you'll know what fluoroscopy is. Fluoroscopy is a technique that allows the radiologist to visualize the moving body. Just like when the Tasmanian Devil, in the Bugs Bunny cartoons, walks behind an x-ray screen and you can see all of his bones as he dances around. Examples of fluoroscopic examinations include imaging of the bile ducts, called a cholangiogram, or looking inside a woman's uterus and fallopian tubes to diagnose causes of infertility. This is called a hysterosalpingogram. Tomograms are generated in a special way. You're probably most familiar with the tomogram as how a CT scan or a CAT scan is created. 
Tomography is a method in which an object is imaged by using radiographs focused in a single horizontal geometric plane. The images are then reconstructed using computers so that any plane can be viewed in any direction. The most common plane used is a transverse plane, but the computer can reconstruct the images into a sagittal, coronal, or oblique plane, and sometimes into any geometric plane. Already, you're learning to use the language of anatomy. As the patient lies in the CAT scanner, the x-ray source rapidly revolves around him or her, taking thousands of images in a few seconds. The computer then reconstructs these tiny pixelated images into a picture, which you see as the cross-section. Positron emission tomography is a specialized method of imaging. It combines a PET scan, i.e. an image used based on radioactive glucose technology, and merges these somewhat fuzzy images into a CT scan high resolution image to create a single image called a PET fusion CT scan. We'll show you some examples later and this will make more sense as you progress in these insight lectures. Ultrasonography can be used intraoperatively, internally or externally to create a cross-sectional image of the human body. Ultrasonography is usually the easiest and least expensive and often one of the best methods to image the body. Ultrasound is an imaging technique not based on radiation, but based on sound waves. Other techniques such as a gamma knife, mammography, even thermography as well, or other techniques using radioactive chemicals such as technesium can help generate images of the body to aid in the diagnosis of various diseases or conditions often requiring interventional or surgical treatments. Examples of imaging modalities using radioactive technesium include examples such as a HIDA scan, an imaging technique used to image the gallbladder, a Meckel scan which is used to look for a Meckel's diverticulum, you'll learn about that in embryology, a bleeding scan to look for occult gastrointestinal bleeding, a bone scan to look and see whether a cancer has spread to the bones, and a cardiac scan, an imaging study used to assess the functioning of the heart. Angiography, both traditional and computer enhanced, represent ways in which the blood vessels of the body can be imaged. Fluoroscopy is often involved in obtaining these images. Contrast studies, such as an upper GI series, allows us to look at our swallowing mechanisms and the anatomy of the oral cavity, the pharynx, the esophagus, and the stomach. Barium enema examinations are still used today to look at the lower intestine and even the upper intestines. Barium sulfate is allowed to flow from the anus and rectal area into the colon using fluoroscopy to get an image of the entire colon. Bronchograms can be used to assess and analyze and review the anatomy of the respiratory system, but thankfully they've been relegated to history. The patient used to have to inhale barium sulfate to get a picture of the bronchial tree. Google it and get some bizarre images. Bronchography has been replaced with endoscopic visualization of the airways using a tiny endoscope. This imaging technique is called bronchoscopy. It's not a radiographic examination, however. Some radiographic techniques, such as lymphangiography or lymphocentigraphy, allows the radiologist or a surgeon to look at the lymphatic system. It's used today in breast cancer imaging a technique called sentinel node biopsy, and thank God an outdated test called pneumoencephalography, a barbaric technique to look inside the brain and the ventricles to look for brain tumors or blockages of the flow of the cerebrospinal fluid out of the brain cr causing a condition called water of the brain or hydrocephalus is no longer used. Even in the virtual anatomy lab, you'll see some techniques of recreating 3D imagery of the human body. Night vision goggles will not use per se in the diagnosis of human disease, do demonstrate another technique that can be used in imaging in darkness. If you don't know what any of these modalities are, Google them. Use the internet. Use all the materials at your fingertips to increase the flow of information to your brain while you're in medical school. The sky is the limit in medical knowledge. Just for fun, I put a link here to a YouTube video from a game show called Let's Make a Deal. Take a look and you'll better understand why it's so important to use radiological imaging in the evaluation of your patient. Imagine, after watching this video, if each of the contestants in this game show had x-ray vision like Superman and they were able to see behind each of the curtains. But imagine how boring the game would be. 
In medicine, we don't have time to get bored. We have to know what is behind the curtain if we're going to treat our patient properly. I've also placed some images of a pneumoencephalogram, a barium enema, and a bronchogram, which we referenced in the previous slide. Imaging in medicine today is akin to opening up a birthday present. You never quite know what you're going to get when you've opened the present. It's no different when we image our patients who have disease. We use radiology, blood tests, microbiological findings, and of course our physical exam skills, as well as a host of other technologies to help us treat our patients and come to a proper diagnosis. If you think of every patient as a package full of surprises, then you get the idea of what it's like to practice medicine today. Imagine trying to treat your patients as they did a hundred years ago without any imaging modalities. Then you'll be able to understand why some of the crazy things you'll learn, like agophony and pectoriloquy, were used. We'll talk about those in another Insight Lecture. During your physical examination course called Medical Skills, you'll learn a variety of techniques to assess the package without using radiology or sound waves. For example, we often listen to the package using our stethoscopes or we tap on it, called percussing. We feel it, called palpation. Or we look at it, called inspection. We might even shake it. We're trying to figure out what's inside the package without opening it. And in this case, that means without removing the skin and looking inside. That would be a little traumatic and barbaric. Some of you might actually be old enough to remember comic books advertising various gag gifts like these x-ray glasses. Every kid under the age of eight years old wanted a pair until you actually got them and saw that they were just pieces of plastic frame with cardboard inserted for lenses with holes punched in them. Of course, it also came along with a lot of fake claims and that's how they managed to sell them. We don't have anything quite like the real version of x-ray glasses, but Google Glass and some other technologies will soon be used in the examination room. They will allow us to record and broadcast a physical exam for distance learning, teaching, and consultations, maybe even for medical legal purposes. We'll be able to access our patients' medical records, bringing them up instantly, and view them without a bulky computer monitor. Here's a short video clip demonstrating how Clark Kent, otherwise known as Superman, could use his x-ray vision. Go ahead and click on it and it takes about a minute and 52 seconds. We can't do this yet as physicians, but in the future, we might be able to use Google Glass type device to do just that. Just a note, PowerPoint doesn't play very well with video clips, so I would suggest that you take the PowerPoint presentation out of presentation view and click on the video separately. It may perform a little better on your PC or your Mac. I put some of these goofy images in to show you how far we've come in imaging the body using radiographic techniques. To image the body has always been one of the most useful purposes of x-rays, but as technology gets better, sometimes imaging modalities don't even need to use x-rays. An example is an MRI scanner. The MRI scanner actually uses magnetism to image the body. Let's take a look at how we can use our hands and our eyes and our ears and the tips of our fingers to try to assess what's inside the package before we take the patient to the radiology suite. We can listen to the package. We call it auscultation. By using a stethoscope, we can learn a lot about the diagnosis of the patient. The stethoscope is used to listen to heartbeats. It's used to listen for heart murmurs. It's used to listen to bowel sounds or the flow of blood through the various vessels in the body. For example, when we listen to the carotid arteries, if an abnormal sound called a brewy is heard in a blood vessel, it may indicate an impending blockage and that may require surgical intervention. What is a microphone but a listening device? that in turn rebroadcast at a higher volume, i.e. amplification. Yes? Do you agree? Isn't a microphone akin to a unamplified stethoscope? 
we can actually tap a package, just like playing the drums. We can tap the abdomen. We can tap the lungs. And based on what we hear, we make a clinical decision if further studies are necessary. I put a video clip in here of a seven-year-old drummer pounding out Tom Sawyer by Rush's Neil Peart. I put this video in here not because you're going to play the patient's abdomen like a set of bongos, but the technology is basically the same. We're tapping the abdomen and we're listening for the sounds. The character of those sounds determines what's in the package. We tap the lungs and we listen to the characteristic sounds. It tells us if there's fluid in the lungs or if we need to perform further studies. Interestingly, the former drummer of KISS, Eric Carr, shot in the video Forever, is seen here after he was undergoing chemotherapy for a very rare pericardial tumor. The pericardium is a sac around the heart. It's exceedingly rare to have a cancer of this layer around the heart. His hair is a large wig and Paul Stanley, the lead vocalist, has to auscultate his music through his left ear. Paul Stanley was born with only one ear, a rare condition called microtia. Pericardial tumors, microtia, drums, auscultation, kiss, rush, rock and roll, all in a lecture about radiology and physical diagnosis. Today we image the body in a variety of ways and many of those methods provides us with cross sections. A CT scan, an MR scan, and even, if you think about it, a microscope slide of a tumor used in the histology lab. Looking at it under the microscope is another method of using cross-sectional anatomy. Cross-sectional anatomy requires an ability to see past the normal 3D depths that you would see by examining your patient or your cadaver with your eyes or your hands. Cross-sectional anatomy requires an in-depth understanding of the underlying gross anatomy and the ability to flip these images in your head from the 3D cadaver image or from the examination of your body so that you can view the cross-sections just like a slice of bread or slicing cheese or a slice of butter takes a little time to get used to. I placed a link to the Visible Human Project. This project originated at the University of Colorado by Dr. Vic Spitzer and resulted in a computer program which we use called the VH Dissector. VH stands for the Virtual Human. We will use this program in the Virtual Anatomy Lab and by the end of this year you'll be able to read a normal CAT scan as well as a normal human MRI scan and even a normal ultrasound of the liver, thyroid, kidneys, and maybe even breast. You might be able to read a normal mammogram. No other medical school in America exposes their students to the amount of cross-sectional anatomy you get at ATSU. Of course, what if you're percussing the anatomical or human package, looking at it, inspecting it, and feeling it, palpating it, isn't even enough. Today's technology allows us to actually look into the orifices of the human body from the ear canal to the esophagus and stomach to the colon via colonoscopy. Even small, tiny cameras allow us to look inside the Montgomery glands of a woman's breast around the nipple to look for breast cancer. It's truly remarkable. Again, I have linked some videos here to reinforce the idea of looking into the human body using endoscopy. The link is an optical entry into the abdomen showing me in the operating room gaining access to the abdominal cavity using laparoscopy. In addition, I've put a video link here to a cystoscopy looking into a patient's bladder and a video showing you a normal colonoscopy looking into a patient's colon, i.e. the large intestine, to give you an idea of the technology that we have in diagnosing our patients. The technology sometimes can be overwhelming. Again, these video clips are put here to help clear up issues that might be vague to you as a beginning medical student. I strongly suggest that you watch them in their entirety. It'll make you a lot smarter, better, and able to understand things as we move forward in your curriculum. Of course, if we've listened to the package and felt the package and palpated it, even shaken the package and we still don't know what's in it, finally, now we can x-ray it. There, this is no different than the technology that's used in an airport when you're scanned for explosive devices. 
Of course, the speed, the type of radiation, the length of the radiation exposure, and the detail obtained is different, but the idea is the same. The physical examination of our package, i.e. the package of the human body, begins with inspection, looking at it. We have to look at the patient and form a clinical judgment. Do they look sick? Are they faking it? Are they malingering? Are they near death? Are they in pain? Are they happy but complaining that they're in pain? All of these interrogatories allow us to better explain and better assess what's going on with our human package. Truly, the hospital can be a theater of pain. We listen to the package with our stethoscopes. We listen to the patient's lungs. We listen for breath sounds to see if they're equal or if we can hear fluid in the lungs. You'll learn in your physical diagnosis course that various lung sounds lead to various diagnoses. For example, if you've ever taken bubble wrap and squeezed it, the sound that results mimics the sound of a patient suffering from pneumonia or sometimes fluid overload as a result of a failing heart. We can learn a lot just from listening to the package using our stethoscopes. If we can hear blood rushing through the vessels and creating an abnormal sound called a brewery, as we mentioned before, it can be a sign of an impending blockage of a vessel, perhaps even causing a stroke. We learn to see the blood vessels by listening to them. We can also listen with ultrasound or Doppler scanning. We'll learn about these in one of our next Insight Lectures. In our next presentation, we'll learn even more about the physical examination. It's the physical examination which, which should be performed first on any patient before we use radiographs to assess within the human package. But now, let's talk about some review questions. Number one, what is a brewery? Number two, what's auscultation? What's palpation? Number three, what's fluoroscopy and what's an angiogram? What's a bronchogram? What's a pneumoencephalogram? And number four, what's a hysterosalpingogram? Number five, explain tomography and give an example of a tomogram. Number six, give examples of cross-sectional anatomy and the modalities that provide them. And finally, number seven, give an example of two imaging modalities that don't use radiation. I'll answer this one for you. MRI scanning uses the proton spin of the water molecule and magnetism to create an image. And of course, ultrasonography uses sound waves. While they're not radioactive imagery techniques, they are imaging modalities used in the imaging of the human body. We'll see you in just a minute in the next Insight Lecture. I hope you've enjoyed it. For this Insight Lecture, Part 2, please grab your anatomy atlas. You're going to need it. If we're still trying to figure out what's inside our human package, we need to review all of the methods used by early physicians who did not have the luxury of x-rays in the diagnosis and or the treatment of their patients. They used their eyes, inspection, their hands, palpation and percussion, and their ears, auscultation. Today, we do the same before exposing our patients to radiation. Interestingly, even though we still call it the radiology department in most hospitals, many of the imaging modalities do not rely on radiation. An example is the MRI scanner. The MRI scanner, previously called the NMR scanner, i.e. nuclear magnetic resonance scanner, relies on magnetism and proton spin to form an image. The strength of a magnet is measured in teslas. The average magnet strength is about three teslas. The name was changed from NMR imaging to MRI imaging in fear the public would boycott the technology if the word nuclear was used to describe the technique. The technology is the same technology you used in organic chemistry to break down the structure of molecules via their proton spins. Of course, in addition to MRI spectroscopy, ultrasonography is another imaging technique that does not rely on radiation either. In Insight Lecture Number 1, we were reviewing auscultation. Let's continue. 
Let's listen to our human package with our ears or with our stethoscopes. Perhaps even more importantly, we can just listen to our patient talk to us as they tell us what's wrong. It's often said the most important part of the patient's history and physical examination is taking a good medical history. Simply, this means to listen to your patient. Don't listen to interrupt him or her. Listen to understand. If we listen, they will likely lead us to the diagnosis. But what if they don't? Thankfully, we have radiology as one of our options. If we use our stethoscope and listen to our patient's lungs, we can hear lung sounds and a variety of different lung sounds leads us to different diagnoses. Please click on each of the highlighted links to learn about a variety of physical examination techniques used by physicians before the advent of radiological imaging modalities to diagnose their patients. Some of these are ingenious. Remember, some of them also sound silly to us today, but you will not always be practicing where you'll have the most modern technology and radiological interventions. You may someday need agophony or whispered pectoriloquy. Thankfully, in 20 years of my surgical practice, I never needed any of these techniques, even in rural Arizona. But you might be in a place that is far from rural Arizona, and these techniques might come in handy. Boxes come in all sizes, colors, shapes, flavors, sizes, and volumes. So do our patients. Palpation is the art of touching our patients in a clinical manner, allowing us to explore the body's different internal organs or explore the body's external surfaces. We use palpation to try to feel the size of the liver or feel the spleen or to reduce a hernia. You'll learn more about hernias in the neuromusculoskeletal course. Of course, we can also perform percussion on our patient. We spoke about percussion in Insight Lecture Number 1. It's the sound guiding us to a proper diagnosis as we tap our way around the patient. After we have exhausted all the techniques used by our own senses, i.e. inspection, auscultation, palpation, and percussion, now we begin to use radiological techniques available to us, beginning from the simple to the most complex. Perhaps the simplest radiological intervention is a plain chest x-ray. Here's an image of a plain chest x-ray. In this chest x-ray, the patient, obviously female, we can see ribs, lungs, heart, diaphragm, the clavicles, i.e. the collarbones, the scapula, and other anatomical structures. What else can you see? I can see the trachea, bronchi, the carina, and the thoracolumbar vertebra. If you don't recognize any of these terms that I've just mentioned, break open your anatomy atlas and take a look. Another simple radiological test is the abdominal film. This is a particular film consisting of a radiograph from just above the diaphragm to inferior to the pubic symphysis. The image shown here is an abdominal film and next to it on the left is a KUB. KUB stands for kidneys, ureters, and bladder. It's a little different than the abdominal film in that the KUB does not extend quite as far cephalad, i.e. towards the head, as an abdominal film, and the intent is to try to image the kidneys, the ureters, and the bladder. The image on the left shows the pelvis of the kidneys, the ureters, and the bladder containing iodine-containing contrast. A real and normal KUB will not contain contrast. Keep this in mind as we move through the course and you move through your first year of medical school. An abdominal film and a KUB use about the same amount of radiation, but there's subtle differences in what anatomy or body region is actually imaged. Here a plain x-ray of the feet and a plain x-ray of the wrist bones is also demonstrated. You'll need your anatomy atlas now. Can you name the wrist bones and match them to the respective image on this radiograph? Can you name the bones in the feet? The ankle. Can you see all of the bones in the ankle? Which ones can you see? Which ones can you not see? Is the patient wearing shoes? Do you see any fractures? Are the films appropriately exposed for your liking? This radiograph was taken of an elderly patient. 
he slipped and fell onto his pruning shears while he was working in the garden. Click the link below and watch the short video that occurred at Tucson's University Medical Center. Other than the wow, that's amazing effect, what information can you get from this radiograph? How do you think it guided the surgeons in removing the pruning shears from this gentleman's face? We mentioned pneumoencephalography previously. Here are two images demonstrating this, now defunct technique. Grab your anatomy atlas and look up choroid plexus. Can you see the choroid plexus in this pneumoencephalogram? What else can you make out? What else can you see? What bones can you see? Are there any fractures? Are there any other abnormalities that you might be able to make out? Take a look at your anatomy atlas and let it lead you through some of the basic anatomy of this now defunct technique. Examples of mammograms are shown. The mammogram on the far left is a digital mammogram, while the mammogram second from left is an analog plain film mammogram. The films on the upper right are 3D digital mammograms, while those in the lower right are also 3D digital mammograms. The plain two-dimensional mammograms, shown second from the left, are still quite useful today despite the other advances in technology. They are still the most commonly used and, in a way, you've just viewed your first cross-section of human anatomy. Lymphangiography has, for the most part, been relegated to history. This radiological imaging modality was used to assess lymph nodes in patients who had infection or cancer like lymphoma, edema and swelling of an unclear cause or vascular disease. Side effects of lymphangiography include deep venous thrombosis, i.e. a blood clot in the leg, or infection from the procedure itself. Lymphangiography is rarely used today. Sentinel lymph node imaging is used every day in the diagnosis and treatment of breast cancer. The image on the far left explains the technique. Blue dye, lymphazurin or methylene blue, is injected around a tumor. The dye is then adsorbed into the lymphatic channels surrounding the tumor or the cancer. The procedure is often done first by injecting not only a blue dye, but a radioactive chemical, usually technetium, and then the patient is sent for radiological imaging. The image obtained by, quote, viewing, end quote, the radioactive area of the breast is called lymphocentigraphy. These images show how the blue dye progresses in the lymphatic channel, and eventually a lymph node is stained blue. This blue node is called the sentinel lymph node. As the image shows, the sentinel node is the first node draining a chain of lymph nodes or receiving cancer cells from a tumor. It stands at attention, like a sentinel in the military guarding a fort. He's the first lymph node to receive any bullets, or in this case, cancer cells, from the tumor as the cancer attempts to spread throughout the body. This is called metastases. Sometimes the blue dye is not absorbed and the clinician must rely on the radioactivity which was injected. In the operating room, the surgeon will use a Geiger counter to find the sentinel node. The Geiger counter is used to follow the radioactive lymphatics until a lymph node is found with the highest radioactive count. This is the sentinel node. It is removed and sent for pathological inspection to see if it contains cancer cells. If it does, it's a sign that the cancer has attempted and may be successful in metastasizing throughout the rest of the body. Both techniques, i.e. the injection of the blue dye and the injection of radioactive technetium, are complementary, often used on the same patient in the same operation in the same event or in case one of these methods fails to demonstrate the sentinel node. Before we go into more complex radiographs, I'd like you to understand some of the history of radiology. Please watch the associated videos. Here we see two of the first images taken using x-rays. The radiograph on the hand on the right was taken by Dr. Rentgen, whereas the foot x-ray seen through the shoe was taken by Nikola Tesla. Today, the name Tesla has become synonymous with the automobile. 
But that wasn't always the case. Nikola Tesla is responsible for most of our modern technology. And it's safe to say that while many of you have heard of the name Tesla, most of you have never heard of Nikola Tesla. Tesla is given credit for inventing remote control, industrializing alternating current, inventing radio, and the discovery of x-rays in the late 1800s. Nikola Tesla was born in 1856 and died penniless in 1943. But Tesla is giving credit for a multitude of discoveries. However, most of us in our youth were taught that x-rays were discovered by Rentgen, whose picture appears on the right. It took the United States Supreme Court to decide Tesla was the actual discoverer of radio. A gentleman named Marconi was given credit for having discovered radio, but a review of the patents had shown that he actually used many of Nikola Tesla's patents, and the decision was overturned, giving Nikola Tesla credit for inventing radio. Remember that the next time you crank up the FM dial. It took the United States Supreme Court to sort this out. So who really discovered x-rays? Who really discovered radio? Was it Tesla or Marconi? I ask you to remember these names, not to torture you, but because they're important to the modern practice of medicine. Many surgical operations, instruments, measuring units, among automobiles and even rock groups with the name Tesla, are named after these early pioneers in physics. We mentioned fluoroscopy in Insight Lecture 1. Now, let's take a closer look at how it's actually used. These three short video clips are referenced here to give you an example of how fluoroscopy can be used. Bugs Bunny knew how to use it on the Tasmanian Devil, if you remember Taz, but today's modern equipment, like that shown here, is used for a variety of imaging techniques. The patient can stand on the table while the table is rotated upwards to a standing position or flat at an angle parallel to the floor. We're getting closer to discussing more complex radiographic techniques used in medicine. In Insight Lecture 3, we'll give more examples of radiographic techniques used in the diagnosis of our patients. Learning the names of these techniques will help us to establish the language of medicine as you move through your first year. Thank you for listening. Let's review and ask some simple review questions. Number one, who's Nikola Tesla? Number two, who is Rentgen? Number three, who is given credit for discovering x-rays? Number four, who is given credit for discovering radio? Number five, what is a sentinel lymph node? Number six, what is lymphangiography? What is lymphocentigraphy and how do they differ? Number seven, what are the complications of lymphocentigraphy? Number eight, what are the four techniques we use to perform physical examination on our patients? Number nine, can you name all of the wrist bones and identify them on an x-ray? Number 10, can you name the ankle bones and identify them on an x-ray? Number 11, what is lymphazurin and what is it used for? In part one and part two of this presentation, we saw how the physical examination can help guide the proper diagnosis of a patient's illness. In part two, we began to look at some of the radiological techniques you'll see and use as a physician. Keep your anatomy atlas available to look up the anatomy mentioned here and answer some of the review questions at the end of the presentation. It will only help reinforce your learning. When you finish this third and later the fourth and last part of the presentation, you'll be well versed in the language of radiology, a language necessary for you to understand as you move forward as a medical student. Here's an example of an arthrogram. It's almost been replaced today by the MRI scan. An arthrogram can be used on just about any joint of the human body. The radiograph is obtained by inserting the needle directly into the bursa and injecting iodinated contrast. That's contrast that's made up of an iodine-containing chemical. As you can imagine, it carries the risk of not only being painful, but possibly causing an infection in the joint space. If there is a tear in the joint or bursa, or another injury to the joint, contrast may be seen leaking outside of the joint capsule. The test is most commonly used on the shoulder joint or the knee joint, but it's rarely performed today. 
MRI imaging of the shoulder and knee has mostly replaced arthrography. Prior to the advent of the fiber optic endoscope, a physician was often faced with making a diagnosis of abnormalities affecting the gastrointestinal tract. To view the gastrointestinal tract, we use upper GI series. This study helps the physician look at the swallowing mechanism, the esophagus, the stomach, and the duodenum. The patient drinks a dilute barium sulfate solution, flavored to taste like a chocolate or vanilla milkshake, and then under fluoroscopy, remember the Bugs Bunny images when we mention fluoroscopy, multiple images are obtained as the patient swallows the barium sulfate contrast and we watch it flow through the esophagus, the stomach, and into the intestines. Single still images or a digital movie of the entire process can be obtained. Here on the left we can see the stomach and a portion of the duodenum. On the far right, we see an upper GI series with a small bowel follow-through. That's abbreviated SBFT. In the middle image, an upper GI is demonstrated with not only the stomach and duodenum being seen, but the proximal portions of the small intestine, notably the jejunum. There are several risk factors associated with upper GI series and or small bowel follow-through studies. They are still commonly used today, giving the physician a significant amount of information on the function and pathology of the patient's internal organs, but it often does so at a price. If aspiration of the barium into the lungs occurs, it can cause severe respiratory compromise and even death. Like the bronchogram shown in our next slide, aspiration of the barium sulfate is usually non-lethal because it is not absorbed and the patient can simply cough it up and out. However, if enough barium is aspirated, it can cause death and respiratory compromise. In addition, barium sulfate, once ingested, can harden like concrete and may become impossible for the body or the physician to remove. Today, these types of studies can be performed with dilute barium sulfate solutions mixed with dilute gastrographin. Gastrographin is a mildly thick, colorless, clear, iodine-containing chemical that is hyperosmolar. While orally or rectally administered gastrographin often results in diarrhea, if it is accidentally aspirated, it can result in significant pulmonary dysfunction and death also. Pulmonary complications are much more common and life-threatening with gastrographin than they are with barium sulfate. The opposite is true in the abdominal cavity. In the abdominal cavity, gastrographin is considered quite safe and barium is considered just the opposite. Keep this in mind in your training. Contrast studies are very commonly used and continue to be used today. They still offer a significant amount of information and often have a therapeutic as well as a diagnostic purpose. For example, a gastrographin enema can cause diarrhea, which may be the intended result if the patient suffers from a colon blockage or severe constipation. You'll see a lot of these studies as you progress through your training. Here we see an example of a contrast study of the colon. These are called contrast barium enema examinations. Like the upper GI series with small bowel follow-through, the barium enema exam can be performed with barium and or gastrographin. The contrast examination is performed with either a single column of the contrast material called, not surprisingly, a single contrast barium enema, or photos under fluoroscopy of the colon, partially evacuated of the contrast material, and then re-insufflating the colon with air. This is called a double contrast barium enema. Air in addition to the contrast material, creates this double contrast. We see that on all of these images. A double contrast barium enema is the type of diagnostic enema most commonly ordered by the physician. Gastrographin is hyperosmolar, contains iodine, and can cause diarrhea. Gastrographin is safe to instill into the colon. However, barium can cause an intense inflammatory reaction within the peritoneal cavity. You'll have to look up peritoneum in your atlas. Therefore, if your patient is under consideration for an operation on the abdomen, it's best to use gastrographin studies rather than barium sulfate 
as it's easier for the body and safer to evacuate the gastrographin and it will not cause an intense inflammatory response. Even though gastrographin contains iodine, it will not elicit an allergic reaction if a patient claims an allergy to iodine, since by giving this chemical into the GI tract, it's not absorbed. It's considered giving it, quote, external, end quote, to the body. Here's an example of a bronchogram. This, again, is an outdated test. The patient inhales dilute barium sulfate in an attempt to visualize the airways and to ascertain whether or not the patient may have an underlying lung cancer or some other pathology. The anatomy of the bronchial tree is shown in the middle photo and on the right a photograph form from the New England Journal of Medicine shows a premorbid photograph of a patient who was drinking dilute barium sulfate for an upper GI series and accidentally aspirated the chemical into his lungs. If you click on the associated link, it will give you the details. The patient died from a severe inflammatory response called a chemical pneumonitis due to the usually innocuous barium sulfate. Note the patient's bronchogram on the left is normal and the patient did survive. On the right, however, the patient's bronchogram was a complication of his upper GI series. That patient died. Remember, these types of studies are not without their risk, and you must be aware of such risks prior to requesting them on your patients. We also use iodinated contrast in the operating room. This radiograph is an example of an intraoperative cholangiogram. The large black arrows on the image on the right shows the left and right hepatic ducts. Go grab your anatomy atlas to look this up. Bile from the liver drains down these ducts and into the common hepatic duct and the common bile duct, eventually draining into the duodenum. The duodenum is the first portion of the small intestine. Use your anatomy atlas to find the left and right hepatic ducts, the common bile duct, and the common hepatic ducts. This contrast material is injected using a plastic catheter placed directly into the bile duct via the cystic duct. Used in the operating room, and contains iodine and a combination of fluoroscopy, this contrast material injected using a plastic catheter placed directly into the bile duct via the cystic duct is used in the operating room and also contains iodine and fluoroscopy is used to obtain these images. To see how the images are obtained, click on the associated links and watch the video. The video is taken from one of my actual patients. It's taken during removal of a gallbladder a procedure called a cholecystectomy. Our technology has become so good, a procedure which is now commonplace allows the physician to insert an endoscope through the patient's mouth, past the esophagus, into the stomach, and finally into the first portion of the duodenum. This procedure is called an endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatogram, or ERCP for short. Click on the video link showing how an ERCP is used to retrieve gallstones from a patient's common bile duct. An ERCP is a useful test to cannulate the bile ducts for not only removing stones, but for sampling the bile duct if cancer is suspected. Of course, an ERCP is not without its complications. One complication of ERCP is perforation of the duodenum. The large red arrow in the center image shows how a catheter can be placed retrograde into the biliary duct system. Retrograde meaning against the flow of bile. MRI technology allows us to obtain non-invasive images of the bile ducts. Here we see three images of bile duct anatomy obtained using an MR scanner. This is known as an MRCP, Magnetic Resonance Cholangiopancreatogram. As opposed to the intraoperative cholangiogram, which requires a catheter to be placed directly into the common bile duct via the cystic duct, and in contradistinction to the ERCP, an MRCP may only require light sedation if your patient's claustrophobic, as MR scanners are rather tight fit. The first image shows a significantly enlarged bile duct with tortuous hepatic bile ducts. This patient most likely has an obstruction of the common bile duct. The labeled image on the far right shows a stone in the gallbladder and a stone in the common bile duct. 
This patient will require an ERCP to remove the stone in the bile duct and a cholecystectomy to remove the stone in the gallbladder. The center image, also a MRCP, shows a gallbladder and the common hepatic duct. If you look closely, you can also see the pancreatic duct. Some contrast is also seen in the small intestines. This test, the MRCP, is very useful if your patient is not a candidate for an ERCP or for an operation. A hysterosalpingogram is an invasive gynecological test to assess for causes of infertility. In these images, we see a hysterosalpingogram. Once we understand the anatomy of the cervix, the endometrium of the uterus, and whether the fallopian tubes are patent, open, we can infer causes of a patient's infertility. The middle image shows us a blocked fallopian tube on the patient's left salpinx. Whether it's blocked from cancer, prior surgery, or a congenital malformation is unclear. It simply tells us the patient only has one properly functioning oviduct. A hysterosalpingogram, while still used today, has mostly been replaced by the use of hysteroscopy. Hysteroscopy is the use of a fiber optic endoscope inserted into the uterus and eventually into each individual fallopian tube to assess for any underlying abnormalities, i.e. pathology of the reproductive system of the female. Coronary angiography is used almost daily to assess for underlying coronary artery disease by cardiologists all over the country. The coronary arteries supply blood to the heart. In these images, we can see a catheter being inserted either into a femoral artery or one of the arm arteries, i.e. a brachial artery, and the coronary arteries are subsequently cannulated by the catheter. To help you understand some of the anatomy, you should break open your anatomical atlas to learn the names of the coronary arteries. In one image, they'll have been labeled for you. Learn where the left anterior descending artery, LAD, circumflex artery, left main coronary artery, and the left coronary artery are visualized. Please know anatomical atlases will refer to the left anterior descending artery, the LAD, as the anterior interventricular artery. Just like coronary angiograms, we can also obtain an image under fluoroscopy of the vasculature of the brain. This is called a cerebral angiogram. Review the anatomy of the image on the left and see if you can locate those vessels in the radiograph on the right. The middle image is taken from Cyber Anatomy, a program you'll have access to via the Learning Resources Center through A.T. Still Memorial Library. Just like classical angiography, i.e. coronary angiography, we can use an MR scanner to obtain images of the blood vessels. Much like the MR scanner was used to give us an image of the bile ducts, i.e. the MRCP, see slide number 8, we can obtain a magnetic resonance angiogram, or MRA. Here's an example of a cerebral angiogram obtained via the MR scanner. The patient does require intravenous contrast, a chemical called gadolinium, but there is little risk to this procedure. As you can see from this image, compared to the image on the previous slide, the MR angiogram can reveal spectacular images and anatomy. Of course, if the MR scanner can give spectacular images of the cerebral vasculature, we would also expect spectacular images in cross-section of the human brain. Here we see sagittal and transverse images of the human brain. Depending on the strength of the magnet, if you'll recall measured in Teslas, we can obtain spectacular images of the human brain in cross-section. As the scanners become better, use stronger magnets, faster computers, and intravenous gadolinium contrast, the images we obtain are truly spectacular and mirror those you'll find in your anatomy atlas. If you want to learn more about MR technology, a link has been provided to you. Please review this 28-minute video. It has information in it you'll need to know and use for the rest of your medical careers. In a previous presentation, we spoke about tomography. In the next slide, slide 15, we'll see how a CT scanner works. However, a simple tomogram is called an intravenous pilogram, abbreviated IVP. An IVP is a tomogram obtained by focusing the X-ray beam at a specific horizontal plane in the body with the patient lying supine. We focus the X-ray beam on the kidneys and bladder, 
the x-ray source is then moved back and forth rapidly over the patient while focused in one anatomical plane, giving an image of whatever anatomy is present in that single focal plane. Everything outside of the focal plane is blurry and appears outside of focus. That's the desired effect. In the next slide, slide 15, if you watch the video, you'll see an awesome history given to you of the history of the CAT scanner. A CT scanner uses computerized tomograms, hence the name, to provide spectacular images inside the body. A CT scanner and IVP both use radiation, while an MRI image does not use radiation. Here we see a photo of a normal CT scanner. Interestingly, the Beatles, yes, those guys, the rock group, are often given credit for inadvertently providing funding for CT scanner development through their EMI record company. However, this article refutes this and says the Beatles may not have contributed financially to the funding of these initial experiments leading to the development of the CT scanner. It's interesting reading, especially if you're a rock and roll aficionado. If you would like to see a complete body CT scan, click on the other link to view a one minute CT scan of one of my actual patients who had breast cancer. Of course, just like the MR scanner, we can focus the plane of a computerized tomogram machine on any organ or vessel. This tomography allows us to obtain elaborate angiograms. If the CT scan is only focused on reconstructing images of the vasculature, we can command and write the program to do that. The image on the right is a CT angiogram. The vessels are abnormal because rather than being smooth, they're somewhat ratty. Yes, that's what we call it, ratty, and full of plaque. Three examples of tomography, an IVP, a CT scanner, and an MR scanner. Two of the three use radiation, the third doesn't. Let's review what we've learned in this presentation. Here's some review questions. What is an arthrogram? What two joints are most commonly viewed with arthrography? What study has nearly replaced arthrography? What is an upper GI series? What is a small bowel follow-through? What are the complications of barium sulfate? What are the complications of gastrographin? Where is the duodenum located? Where is the jejunum located? What is a double contrast barium enema? How is it performed? What is a single contrast enema? What two contrast materials are used for a double contrast enema of the colon? What is a bronchogram? What substance is used in a bronchogram? What endoscopic technique has replaced bronchography? What is an intraoperative cholangiogram and how is it obtained? What chemical is used to obtain the intraoperative cholangiogram photos? Where is the common bile duct? Where is the common hepatic duct? What is an ERCP and how is it performed? What is an MRCP? What is a hysterosalpingogram? What is hysteroscopy? Where are the common insertion points to obtain a coronary angiogram? What are the names of the largest coronary arteries? What is a cerebral angiogram? Where are the vertebral arteries? From what structures do the vertebral arteries arise? You'll use your anatomy atlas for this. What is an MR angiogram? What is a tomogram? Give examples of three studies relying on tomography. What is an intravenous pilogram? How is an IVP obtained? What IV contrast is used during an IVP? Who invented the CT scanner? Explain in brief how a CT scan obtains its images. What is a CT angiogram? How is it obtained? What is an MR scanner? How does an MR scanner work Compare and contrast that to a CT scan. And who are the Beatles? And why is their history important in the practice of medicine today? In this last Insight Lecture, we're going to cover the remainder of the radiological testing techniques you should be familiar with as you continue to learn the language of radiology. The techniques which you have learned so far, while numerous, hopefully have been a little more digestible given over four parts instead of one large lecture. Let's continue. 
Ultrasonography, based on sound waves and not radiation, is one of the most commonly used radiographic techniques. It's easily accessible and relatively inexpensive. Today's ultrasound machines range from large hospital units to smaller units that can be carried in a medical student's pocket. For example, look at General Electric's V-Scan unit. Ultrasonography, because of its safety, ease of use, relative inexpensiveness, and of course portability, is used to image almost every part of the body. Here in the upper left corner, we see a handheld portable ultrasound unit manufactured by General Electric. Ultrasound, along with Doppler imaging, which measures blood flow in the blood vessels, can be used to assess for disease in blood vessels such as narrowing, also known as stenosis, plaque formation, atherosclerosis, or even fistulas, an abnormal communication between an artery and a vein. In the center image, the technologist is performing an abdominal ultrasound on a patient. Please keep your anatomy atlas handy. You're going to need it. Remember, in this presentation, the transcript can be found under the paperclip icon, along with the PowerPoint slides if you'd like to download them. Furthermore, you'll soon notice I often use links to YouTube videos because it's much easier than embedding an entire video. Doing this makes for a smaller presentation and experience has taught me PowerPoint does not play well with embedded videos. Please take advantage of these links and watch these YouTube videos. I've reviewed them and I think they're important. Here in this slide we can see an ultrasound of the liver and the kidney. The image in the upper left shows how the ultrasound beam passes through the liver and images not only the liver but the kidney. In the area below the liver but above the kidney we can see a space called Morrison's pouch. Fluid can collect here. It can be normal or abnormal depending on how much fluid collects here and what the clinical presentation of the patient is like. Two of the three images clearly show fluid beneath the liver and above the kidney in Morrison's pouch. It's probably normal, probably normal physiologic amounts of fluid. Ultrasound is usually performed external to the body, through the skin and can also be performed intraoperatively into a variety of anatomical cavities, for example, the thorax, the abdomen, or the pelvis. Here we can see an intraoperative ultrasound probe used to assess whether there are gallstones in the gallbladder and or the common bile duct. The middle lower image shows gallstones within the gallbladder. Notice how the ultrasound beam causes a shadow as it passes through the gallstones. The relevant anatomy is reviewed in the image located in the upper left. Interestingly, intraoperative ultrasound and radio frequency techniques can also be used not only to find tumors, but to ablate them intraoperatively. The technology is almost endless for ultrasound. In addition to ultrasonography being performed externally, as we just saw, internally, looking at the bile ducts, it can also be used in the pelvis. The images in the upper left show a procedure called pelviscopy. This is an operative procedure where laparoscopic instruments are placed into the pelvis. In this patient, who's had a hysterectomy or removal of the uterus, we can see the sigmoid colon and what's left of the fallopian tubes and ovaries. I've labeled these structures for you. The image in the upper right shows a transvaginal ultrasound being performed. The image in the lower right shows the relevant anatomy. This is a sagittal view of the uterus, showing us the endometrium of the uterus, the myometrium of the uterus, i.e. the muscular portion of the wall of the uterus, and the entire uterus proper. The image on the lower left shows urine in the urinary bladder. Again, we can see the endometrial lining in the myometrium and they have outlined the uterus for us to visualize. Thus, in slide number five and slide number four, we've seen how ultrasound is used to visualize the liver and the right kidney, the gallbladder, Morrison's pouch, and we've reviewed a transvaginal image of the uterus as well as intraoperative placement of an ultrasound probe to assess the bile ducts and the organs of the pelvis. 
Another way ultrasound can be used is to assess cardiac function. Transthoracic ultrasonography of the heart, called echocardiography, is not as sensitive as is transesophageal echocardiography. This picture shows a patient under sedation with an endoscope that's been fitted with an ultrasound unit at the tip being placed into the distal esophagus to view the cardiac valves. This is the best and most accurate way to assess the cardiac valves except for maybe cardiac angiography which is much more invasive and has the possibility for more complications. Transesophageal echocardiography is more invasive than transthoracic external echocardiography. If I want to look at a patient's heart valves, we've already learned that there are several ways to do it. One, I can auscultate the heart with a stethoscope, which will give me an audio view of cardiac valvular function by listening for murmurs. Number two, I can perform a transthoracic echocardiography through the skin of the chest. Or number three, transesophageal echocardiography, or coronary angiography, or maybe even five, a CT MRI angiogram, i.e. MR angio or CT angio. However, the best images will be obtained through transesophageal echocardiography. It goes without saying, we know what's supposed to be in this package. Today, ultrasonography generates a 3D image, and for marketing reasons, to sell these ultrasound units to physicians, it's termed 4D ultrasound. The three dimensions of the X, Y, and Z axes, with time being the fourth dimension. We believe transabdominal and pelvic ultrasonography to be safe during pregnancy, but some clinicians have attempted to link it to autism. The data is statistically insignificant and does not support this claim. However, always keep in mind any imaging technique has risk. Two radiographic studies which require the injection of a radioactive isotope, usually technetium, are the bone scan and HIDA scan respectively. In this slide, we see a patient who is having a bone scan performed. The patient has been injected with the radioactive isotope and is sitting under a gamma camera. The gamma camera is a high-tech Geiger counter which measures radioactivity levels and converts those detected radiation levels into an image. The picture obtained is shown on the right. The most important aspect of interpreting an image from a bone scan is to look for symmetry. If there are any abnormally generated areas of high intensity shown by the black marks that may be unilateral on one side, these raise suspicion for underlying disease such as metastatic cancer, trauma, fractures, even arthritis. This patient has symmetric lesions and his findings are most consistent with a normal bone scan, probably with arthritis in each of the respective joints. Here we have a HIDA scan, also known as cholecentigraphy, and previously known as a papitis scan. You'll learn later what the initials stand for, but for now, just understand this is a radioactive test, much like the bone scan, where the patient is injected with technetium and using a gamma camera, images are obtained. In this image, on the left only for comparison purposes, I've given you an upper GI series showing the relevant anatomy, the stomach, the duodenum, and the intestines, the small intestines. On the right is a normal HIDA scan. Here you can see the liver, the gallbladder, the common bile duct, the small intestine, the mesentery, and a small amount of bilious reflux back into the stomach. If the patient has gallbladder disease, the gallbladder will not be seen at all, or it'll be seen after a delayed amount of time has gone by, usually hours. Normally the gallbladder, if it's normal, will light up in about 10 minutes. Another radioactive radiological examination is called a Meckel scan. In embryology, you'll learn what a Meckel's diverticulum is and its embryological congenital origins. Here's a photo of a Meckel's diverticulum and a graphic representation of this embryological abnormality. 
A Meckel's diverticulum can wreak havoc in childhood and even adulthood. Complications of a Meckel's diverticulum include bowel obstructions, bleeding, volvulus, known as twisting of bowel, or a volvulus even around the Meckel's diverticulum, and it can, but doesn't have to, contain two types of tissue found in other areas of the body. We call such tissue, which doesn't belong where it's found, ectopic tissue. Notably, a Meckel's diverticulum can contain gastric mucosa and mucosa from the pancreas, pancreatic mucosa. If a patient has a Meckel's diverticulum, and we may have no way of knowing if they do, they may suffer massive gastrointestinal bleeding from the diverticulum. For definition, a diverticulum is just a pouch, and a diverticulum can occur anywhere in the GI tract. These pouches can occur in the esophagus, the small intestine, the jejunum, the ileum, pretty much anywhere, and they can occur in the colon. But a Meckel's is a name for a very specific pouch, occurring in the small bowel, two feet proximal to the ileal cecal valve, about two inches in size, that contains two types of mucosa, parentheses usually in parentheses. A Meckel scan allows the physician to localize the Meckel's diverticulum and assess whether it is present and bleeding or not. Let's take a look at another test that relies on radioactive material. This time it's glucose, not technesium. A PET scan is a relatively new radiological intervention. It's been around for about 20 years. A PET scan is based on an injection of radioactive glucose with the theory cancer has a higher metabolic rate than the surrounding tissues and the cancer will uptake glucose faster than the surrounding tissues. When or if it does, we can image for the radioactive glucose using a positron emission tomography scanner, i.e. a PET scanner. The image on the left is normal. The image on the right is abnormal. We see the CT scan in sagittal view in the image on the right, the PET scan in sagittal view with an abnormality in the mid-thoracic region, and finally the fusion of the two images which clearly shows us there is a metastatic lesion in one of the patient's ribs. The darker spot in the lower pelvis is urine, which has been excreted but contains radioactive glucose. Interestingly, Glucose in the urine raises the possibility that this patient may have underlying diabetes. However, if the patient is given such a huge load of radioactive glucose, the body, of course, during the scanning time, won't be able to use all of that glucose, and by default, it has to be excreted somehow. Be careful interpreting this as diabetes, because it could just be a normal finding of the massive glucose load the patient was given, to try to find any metastatic lesions. Thermography has an interesting history. Thermography is often used by building maintenance supervisors and construction contractors to look for loss of heat energy from a building structure. Thermography has no role in current medical practice today, for any reason. The science is sound and the practical applications of the thermoscope are also sound. However, thermography used to detect breast cancer simply does not work unless the cancer is massive. And by then, you only need your eyeballs to see the cancer and you won't need a thermogram. Remember, you learned about 2D and 3D mammography earlier and how the detection of a small breast cancer of about a millimeter or so in size can be seen on a mammogram. This is not true of thermography. You should never order a thermogram on your patient if you're looking for breast cancer. Thermography is based on changes of blood flow and loss or gain of heat, with the cooler areas appearing blue while the warmer areas appear red. As you can see, the resolution isn't good enough to show you a one millimeter breast cancer. Now we move into the very high-tech areas of radiation oncology and radiation physics. Two types of radiation can be used to treat cancer. These are not, per se, imaging modalities, but are rather treatments. 
Gamma knife therapy uses focused beams of radiation to treat cancer. The patient's head or body must be fixed in a metal cage to prevent movement or the skin is tattooed, so the beam is aimed at the exact same spot with each and every treatment. Occasionally, you may run into these patients who have tattoos on their forehead or on the sides of their head or any areas of their body. These patients are receiving some sort of gamma knife therapy. The image on the right shows proton therapy and a link to how proton therapy works as well as other links showing how gamma knife therapy works from the patient's perspective. Proton therapy is currently the most expensive medical treatment in the United States. It's based on years of research and the application of protons, not neutrons or x-rays, to treat intracranial neoplasms as well as other neoplasms. The patient must have a special individually fitted headgear before treatment can begin. Because of the characteristics of proton therapy, and the physics of proton movement in a magnetic field, it allows a beam of protons to enter at an exact depth without damaging surrounding tissues. Such is not necessarily true of gamma knife treatments, although over the years they have improved. Now let's look at an actual clinical use of radiological imaging in a patient who has a metastatic skin cancer to the brain, in this case malignant melanoma of the skin that has spread to the brain. Here we see two MRI images showing the metastatic melanoma which is seen as the large bright white spot about the size of a walnut on these MRI images. If you click the link you can watch the neurosurgeon remove the metastatic melanoma from the brain tissue. The neurosurgeon transects the dura matter of the brain, exposes the brain, and then uses fine pointed electrocautery forceps known as bipolar cautery to exactly cauterize the blue tissue and not the surrounding brain. As you would expect a melanoma is blue in color because it contains melanin. This is a clinical example of how imaging using MRI is being used to localize a tumor and treat our patient. It is likely after the operation has been performed the patient will have further radiation treatments to the brain in an attempt to control any potential for recurrence. Let's review some of the anatomy and imaging techniques presented in this part four presentation. Make sure you have your anatomy atlas available. Number one, give four examples of how ultrasound is used to image the body. Number two, where is Morrison's pouch? Number three, what is a Meckel's diverticulum? How large is it? Where is it usually located? What types of mucosa are usually found in it? What is a Meckel scan? Number four, what is a transthoracic echo? Number five, what is a transesophageal echo? Number six, which type of echocardiography is most sensitive to view the heart valves? Number seven, what is a bone scan? What is the chemical used in the bone scan? Number eight, what is a HIDA scan? Number nine, what is a Meckel scan and what does it specifically look for, i.e. what complications can occur from a Meckel's diverticulum? Number ten, what is a PET scan? What chemical is used in a PET scan? Number eleven, what is thermography? Number twelve, what is gamma knife therapy? Number 13, what is proton therapy? Number 14, what does stenosis mean? What is atherosclerosis? What is Doppler imaging? 